So to continue our discussion of relational frame theory in a different setting, I introduced last time the ideas of stimulus equivalence and how the meaning of the word is uh, is constructed through learning that when one thing has a relationship to another, uh, that usually that means that the other thing has a relationship to the first thing. So that if a small child learns that first they see uh, this object and uh, then they hear the word glasses, they learn that if they hear the word glasses, they should see this object. And they begin to generalize that uh, so that bidirectionality of uh, relations um, is what stimulus equivalence is, and it's what is is, and that's the relational frame of correspondence. This is all nonsense, of course, if you haven't watched the first video. So, <clears throat> apologize, I won't go over that material again. You can go back and watch the first video if, if uh, this isn't making sense. Uh, but essentially, uh, although it is very intuitive, we are the only animals in which uh, one can readily demonstrate that there is derived relational responding, that there is a derived relation uh, that is not taught, that if uh, the sound glasses precedes the stimulus, then uh, this stimulus will evoke the sound glasses, and so forth. X implies Y, then uh, implies that y implies x, or x is a relation to y implies that y is a relation to x, and that's uh, a derived stimulus response, derived stimulus relation, pardon. So to understand relational frame theory and why it's important, I left off saying let's, that we're going to talk a little bit about why we should care before we even go on and elaborate uh, relational frame theory and talk about other relational frames, talk about the arbitrary applicability of relational frames and other properties of relational frames. Let's talk about why we should even care in the first place. As much as I'm stumbling over my tongue today, I think I can accomplish that. <clears throat> why should we care? Okay, well, this has to do with stimulus function. Stimulus function. Okay, as someone without a rigorous training in behavior analysis, it took me a little while to grasp what behaviorists mean by the function of a stimulus. It's really rather straightforward, and it's really, really important to understanding this stuff. Uh, so pardon me if, if um, you're, you're way past that, but I wasn't when I was introduced to this material. So let me, let me spend a little time on stimulus function. So, first of all, what's a stimulus? Well, <laughs> anything is a stimulus. If it has any impact on our um, organism psychologically, if there's any response from the uh, nervous system, if there's any behavior in response to something, then that thing by definition is a stimulus. Now, how we respond, how that particular stimulus uh, tends to cause us to respond is its function. So the function uh, for most of us for a pile of rotting rodents is to disgust us, to nauseate us, to make us move away from it, uh, to evoke disgust. Ugh. Okay, that may not be the sake, excuse me, that may not be the same case for an animal that subsists on rotting flesh. Uh, the stimulus function for rotting animals for that creature may be to cause approach and ingestion, eating. Uh, for us, it usually evokes disgust. That's the function of the stimulus. So what differentiates us from animals, and this is why I call RFT earth-shaking and really, really exciting, is because I, I think that we finally understand what really makes us different from animals and what language really is and why we call our communication language and while, why we don't call animal communication language. This has taken some time to understand, and I think we now understand it. Um, so um, 
there are arbitrary and non-arbitrary properties of stimuli. Okay, let's talk about what we mean by that. A pile of dead rodent, rodents has non-arbitrary stimulus functions. It stinks. You look at it and it looks disgusting. The function is from non-arbitrary, actual, real, directly palpable, physical properties of the stimulus. It stinks, it looks disgusting, and it has a powerful function of evoking disgust in us. Okay, now <laughs> that's true of an actual pile of rotting, slimy rodents. Okay, but how many of you are actually at this moment feeling a little bit of disgust when I talk about a pile of rotting, stinking, jelly-like, pulpy rodents? Raise your hand. Anyone out there actually feeling just a little bit disgusted by this description or maybe just mildly repulsed or maybe kind of just wishing I would stop talking about it? Okay, that would be arbitrary stimulus functions because if I switched languages when I switch back to English you're actually going to have some functions associated with uh, what I'm saying apart from the ar non-arbitrary stimuli functions. So uh, to break that down a little further, when I lapsed into another language, which happened to be Hebrew, you did not understand what I was saying unless you happened to know Hebrew. Uh, the, the stimulus functions of those words were probably not arbitrary. They were probably just because of how they sounded. Kind of guttural. You might have said, well, is he speaking Hebrew, Arabic? What's going on here? Okay. It, to get a little bit more dialed in, if I take a single word and I say the word to you and I say, Michabel, Michabel, it has non-arbitrary stimulus functions if you don't know Hebrew. I mean, it has those functions if you do know Hebrew, but those become less salient. What becomes salient, if you know Hebrew, are the arbitrary stimulus functions. That is, that arbitrarily, the sound Michabel in Hebrew happens to signify the same thing as the word terrorist signifies in English. Now, when I say terrorist, you're probably not focusing on how many R's there are in that word. I mean, if you were a non-English speaker, you might say, that's a funny word. It goes, ar, 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 ar. Okay, those are non-arbitrary stimulus functions. But the word terrorist has a lot of arbitrary stimulus functions. So if I say terrorist, in my somewhat New york -y accent, you might, speaking of New York, picture in your mind something bad happening to the World Trade Center. You might picture someone getting shot. Or maybe you might think about something to do with how um, some people are labeled terrorists and others are not for committing violent acts, or whatever. These are arbitrary stimulus functions. The non-arbitrary functions are the physical properties of the word, uh, such as michabel, which includes a guttural <sighs> that we don't have in English, so that becomes salient. How are we doing for time here? Let's let's talk just a little bit more. So. Uh, words have these functions arbitrarily such that if I talk about a pile of steaming, stinking, dead, rotting rodents, that may evoke disgust. But that's not, that is an arbitrary property of that uh, expression that I just stated. There's nothing about the stimulus the sounds themselves that I just made that is disgusting. And indeed, if I said it in a different language, it would not probably be disgusting to you. Probably whatever non-arbitrary functions of the language, the sounds of the language would come across. So, uh, you know, if I start speaking another language um, and uh, uh, said something like, um, um, Woba, Nidafangza, Shala. 
you might say, well, that, that's an interesting sounding sentence. But if you knew Chinese, you would know that I just said, I burned your house down. Okay, so you can see how different those two functions are. One just sounds Chinesey, that's the non-arbitrary function, and the other, arbitrarily, because language is arbitrary, has a completely different function. If I tell you, hey, I just burned your house down, you might think that was funny if you didn't think I was being serious, and that would be the function, to amuse you. Or you might find that upsetting in some way if you believed me. But that's, a, that's an arbitrary property of the stimulus of he, uh, the sentence, I just burned your house down. So I think we've taken that about far enough, but I think that's an important piece of the puzzle to really getting why RFT is so cool. And that's what I want to get across to you by the end of this series, is why I think RFT is so cool. If, if there's any takeaway, that would be it. Um, for better or for worse, one has to get all these pieces together uh, to see why people like me think RFT is really cool and potentially really, really useful for learning ACT. So we shall soldier on in part three, wherein I will talk about some other cool properties. Cool to me. I mean, that's, talk about arbitrary. Some other cool properties of um, relational frames and how they work and why they're important. Thanks.